Welcome to Brain and a Vat. Jason and I have a very special guest tonight. We have uh, Helen Robertson, who is a trained philosopher, but is um, in the computer science department at the University of the Witwatersrand. Um, and Helen, I gather you're going to be talking to us a bit about time travel tonight. Would you like to start with a thought experiment? Let's suppose that Mark's uh, grandfather, Mark's grandfather, his name is uh, Mal, and suppose that both Mark and Mel have uh, a kind of great love for whiskey, right? So from time to time, Mark has Mel over, has him for a whiskey evening, and they drink whiskey together. Um, but suppose that Mark finds out that Mel, in fact, has designs on his whiskey collection, right? So Mark, being the great whiskey lover that he is, he, you know, he sort of thinks that this won't do, and he, he becomes quite quite concerned about this and he thinks well something needs to be done about this situation i'm going to i'm going to sort this out and i am going to uh really make sure that that nothing happens to my whiskey collection right so he goes off and he gets himself a, a pistol or a shotgun as you like depending on whichever you think is more effective and he goes for some shooting lessons um and he becomes really quite a, a good shot right so Mark then goes along to, he knows some of Mel's movements, of course he knows, he knows where Mel lives. And on one of the days he creeps into the bushes and he's waiting there for Mel to arrive home, right? So he's there, he's got the shotgun or the pistol, uh, he's got a sort of clear, clear view of Mel arriving home. Um, and suppose that as things turn out, as things play themselves out, Mark takes a shot at Mel and he, he gets him and so Mark kills him. Right. Um, okay, so this is the first sort of segment, right? Um, second, second segment, Jason comes along to Mark and he says, well, look, you'll, you'll never believe it. I mean, I know that I'm, I do the sci-fi thing. Um, but, but part of what I've written can serve as a blueprint for a time machine, right? And so I've, I've built this time machine. It's uh, in the spare room in my flat. And, you know, if you'd like to give it a try sometime, then, then you can, you, you're welcome to, you know, here, here are the keys to the time machine. You can just come by and, and use it when you like. And so Mark, of course, thinks that this is, well, Mark is not going to give up the opportunity. And so, he um he thinks well if i uh travel back in time i can i can nip mel's interest in whiskey in the bud right so even before mel int uh, develops an interest in whiskey i'm gonna go back i'm gonna travel back and i'm gonna you know i'm gonna stop this thing uh at its source the mark climbs into the time machine he you know turns the dials enters the dates as you do uh, and so he travels back to Mel's sort of young, younger years, right? Teen, sort of teen years, okay? Um, and so in between, he, he lands in, say, 1935, 1935 in Johannesburg. And in between, he thinks, okay, well, you know, I've got a little bit of time to spare. Um, I hear that the city library is opening. I'm going to go past the city library you know, have a look at this occasion, seeing as I'm here, and then I'm going to go on and I'm going to find younger Mel and I'm going to sort this situation out. So he goes past the Johannesburg Library and he has a look at this occasion. He thinks that's great. And as he's there, he, um, he, he takes a step in some concrete that's setting, right? So the concrete then sets with Mark's uh, footprint in it, right? And of course, uh, given that this is in 1935, the concrete is set, we can now go to the, to the library buildings and see Mark's footprint set in this concrete. Okay. Um, all right, and then, well, finally on to the main, the main point. So, um, Mark has now gone back in his time machine, he's got his pistol with him, and similarly, he's, he's sort of read up on Mel's whereabouts, uh, he spends a little bit of time kind of sussing out Mel's habits, etc., young Mel's habits. And so again, he is 
uh, waiting in the bushes for young Mel to arrive home. Okay. And so he's, he's there, he's behind the bushes, he's got the same training as he had in the previous case. Um, he's got the pistol, he's got a clear shot. And it seems like he can kill Mel, right? Um, it seems like he is in precisely the situation that uh, Mark of 2020 is in when he's when he's about to take a shot at Mel. Um, but given that we know that Mel still needs to meet his, uh, his partner, still needs to have Mark's father, Mark's father still needs to have him, given that Mark is there to shoot Mel, um, it simply cannot be that he can shoot Mel, right? Um, there isn't any as philosophers would say, there isn't any possible world in which uh, Mark is there to shoot Mel. Okay. And so the, uh, the paradox essentially is, the grandfather paradox essentially is the, the contrast between these two cases. So on the one hand, we've got, uh, you know, Mark in 2020, all of the same training, he's got a clear shot, and we want to say he can shoot Mel. Um, Whereas in the case of 1935, we've got young Mel there, um, but Mark can't shoot Mel, and it's not clear why. And this is essentially the paradox. And um, so what we really want is some sort of account of why in the 1935 case, Mark is unable to shoot Mel. What makes it the case? that Mark is unable to shoot Mel when the situations seem quite similar um, in terms of Mark's capacity, abilities, the physical setup of the situation, etc. So from what I gather, one of the ways of solving the paradox is that I can shoot Mel, um, but when I, when I shoot him and the bullet goes off, so we don't have the sort of impossibility problem of um, Mel never having kids and me never being born and therefore never being able to shoot him, that at that moment, we have a parallel universe that gets created. And really what I've done is not kill Mel, but kill um, Mel too in this other parallel universe. And that allows the sort of, um, you know, in other words, me to still be born because original Mel survives um, and it's only parallel Mel that gets killed. But I wonder, is this, is this a genuine case of time travel? Because part of why we find the idea of time travel so alluring is this idea of being able to fix our pasts. So, you know, people sort of say, I did this stupid thing. You know, I, I married the wrong woman and if only I could take it back, if only I could go back in time and never meet her, then I wouldn't be in this miserable marriage with these three screaming children. And so I want to reverse history. Or if I'm more noble, you know, I, I want to stop John F. Kennedy from being assassinated, um, you know, or uh, Idi Amin from coming to power. Um, and I want to undo what has happened. And I wonder if in the parallel universe case, we're just sidestepping the problem. Because are we undoing anything? Aren't we just creating a whole new parallel set of problems? Yes, I, I, I think that's right. Uh, I think that's, that's also the kind of commonly accepted view I think, in sort of uh, philosophy of time, which is, well, I suppose there are two sort of questions here. So on the one hand, there's the question of changing the past. Uh, and it's generally thought that or accepted that to change the past is, is not a possibility. So if we, if we think that time travel of some sort is possible, it's not going to be of the sort that involves changing the past. Um, and then I suppose the other, the other issue or the other question is that of the, the kind of parallel universe or time splitting setup. And similarly, as soon as we're sort of entering into uh, questions of time splitting in some way, it's, it's generally not taken to be 
uh, a case of genuine time travel, um, or at least maybe not of the sort that we're interested in. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I suppose that the, the kind of paradigm cases of time travel, uh, and at least the sorts of cases that are kind of accepted in the literature and, and among philosophers of time as, as being paradigm cases of time travel are cases in which um, we do travel, well, either, you know, significantly forward to the future or back to the past, but in which it is the time that we are located in. So the history of this world um, and the timeline of this world, it would be traveling within that. I think these are, these are really counted as the kind of paradigm cases. If we think that there is going to be time travel of some sort, or at least the, the, the sort of time travel that uh, philosophers are most interested in as um, being genuine cases of time travel, uh, or what we would think was time travel, are cases in which we're traveling, yes, back to the history within, you know, the history that we are in. Um, and so if you have the time splitting cases where you, you go back to some event, but you end up doing something that didn't occur in the history of our, um, you know, in, in our history, uh, then you're essentially talking about a different history. Um, and, and these sorts of cases are, I suppose, generally not thought to be genuine cases of time travel. Yeah, so um, Mark's solution of the parallel world split isn't really satisfying, right? Because as Mark says, and as you say, we want to go back and affect our history, not some other parallel mm -hmm. history that was similar to ours until I made the change. Um, we want to affect our past so that we can affect our present. Okay, so um, there's another version of time travel which appears um, in a collection of short stories. And the author's name is Ted Chiang. Um, and he wrote, uh, the, I think the collection of short stories that he wrote that I'm thinking of is called Exhalation. Um, and there he buys into this kind of idea of fatalism. Okay, and it's no more satisfying than Mark's approach, but it's kind of more infuriating. You said you want to be infuriated, so we're going to try, right? So, so, Ted, so Ted's, Ted's method is infuriating for a different reason. So Chiang says, okay, um, imagine one day you walk into a shop in Iran. The whole thing is set in Iran, and I think he's trying to buy into some kind of Iranian folklore here. Okay, so imagine there's, there's, this, there's this shop. It's a, it's a fabric store in Iran one day and you walk in and there's a mirror um, except when you look at the mirror carefully you're not actually seeing yourself uh, you're seeing through it and it looks almost like a portal okay and and so what's on the other side well it looks just like the store but actually it's not the store today because if you look carefully you can see through the window of the store on the other side of this of this portal and there's people walking around who aren't walking around in front of your mirror, right? In front, sorry, in front of your storefront. So you realize that this is happening at a different time. And you ask the store owner and you say, how far does this portal go backwards or forwards? And he says, well, it depends on the portal. I can set it, right? This particular setting goes back three years. So you say, oh, that's amazing. There are all sorts of things I would like to do. I'd like to go back three years and I'd like to tell my, my previous self not to get hit by that car on that particular day, um, not to marry that awful woman, um, but to marry that other wonderful woman, uh, to tell myself what the lottery numbers were going to be that day, et cetera, et cetera, right? So he says, well, you can try this. Uh, there's a certain price. You can walk through the, you can walk through the portal. Uh, here's the cost. I've been selling tickets for quite some time and off you go. Right. So in the story, that's what people do. They buy tickets and off they go. And what happens is that when they walk through the mirror or through this portal and they try to change the past is that they just can't. They just never manage to get to that day in time to stop themselves from being hit by the car. 
and they just never manage to inform themselves that they, that, that they shouldn't marry this woman. Or they do, but their former self, because of being told that, although they weren't going to marry the woman, now suddenly is doubly galvanized to. And then they remember in their distant past, oh, there was a man who did come to me and told me not to marry that woman. And that is actually what made me do it in the end. So in other words, it kind of like works its way into the story that already happened. And it creates this kind of fatalistic circularity, which is also totally unsatisfying because you can't go back into the past and change the past, but you do go back and change the past in an important way, which is that you causally influence the past to become what you remember the past to be. Um, so, so it's a very weird way of thinking about time travel. Yes. Um, those, I mean, yeah, th those sound like, pretty great stories and it certainly picks up on a quite important distinction between what's normally termed influencing the past uh, and actually changing the past and um, I mean Mark, Mark has already sort of picked up on this as well and yes so I think in many of these stories what we're interested in is you know the, the possibility of, of changing the past so you know in a person's own life, series of events, A, B, and C has happened, you've chosen to marry this person, you know, you've, you've made some other bad decision. Um, and so what we're interested in, at least partly in the case of time travel, I think that's right, is going back to these events that have actually occurred, that form part of our history, and changing them or making it the case that they didn't occur. Um, and so, it's it's sort of generally accepted. So the it's generally accepted that um, it's not possible to change the past okay? because precisely for the reason that this involves some sort of logical contradiction. Right? So you, you're essentially making the claim that well, look, um, part of the history of the world, setting aside sort of parallel universes or watching time or strange things like this, assuming just a kind of linear, linear time, um, you want to say that the world uh, the, or the series of events that we find taking place in time, uh, the course of history includes events A, B, and C. Um, and then you want to posit that in fact, um, it's now open to you to make it the case that that course of events doesn't include A, B, and C. Um, but it's, you know, it's already been accepted as part of the setup. Um, in, the, in the changing the past case, it's already accepted as part of the setup that they have occurred. Um, and so there is, there's a kind of straightforward contradiction between, between what's being posited there, essentially. Um, and so for the most part, or at least, yeah, it's, it's kind of a sort of general consensus that uh, this business of changing the past, so making it the case that something that was true is no longer true, um, simply is not possible. That's not a, a possible form that time travel can take. Um, so those, yes, insofar as time travel is kind of tempting in this form, um, I suppose we've got bad news for all of us, right? Um, but the other distinction which is influencing the past, um, and this is in a, in a sort of wide range of papers, but Horwich is one of the main ones who was writing in the 70s. And um, so, so he addresses this distinction, what came to be the distinction between, you know, influencing the past and changing the past. Um, and because, so because you can't change something that has already taken place, it doesn't mean that you couldn't initially have had some causal role in what did take place. Um, so the idea is that, you know, if presuming that there is some sort of coherent version of time travel, um, it seems to be uh, thought that that it would be consistent to suppose that somebody could go back um, and causally influence the past, but on the, on the kind of assumption that 
the series of events was always that way, right? So it wasn't that first, the, you know, first history looked like this, and then it looked like that. It would be that history always contained your going back and changing and, and influencing the past. So, you know, just as Mark always went back, uh, it was always the case that Mark went back and left a shoe print, uh, you know, in the setting concrete in front of the library. Um, the, the idea is that he couldn't go back and make it the case that he didn't leave the footprint, um, but nonetheless, he did have a causal role in the past. Um, so potentially there are cases in which, um, you know, you, you can go back and, and have a causal influence of some sort. So this is where my brain starts to really conk out. Okay. Um, so you get, you get these causal loops that happen in a lot of movies and in a lot of fiction around time travel. So I guess it's science fiction. So, um, I, I can never remember the names of all these movies, but there's one where a man goes back in time and meets this charming young woman who turns out to be his mother and has, but he doesn't know this, right? Has a relationship with her and begets himself, um, who then goes back in time and has a relationship with his mother and begets himself. And it's, so it's this loop. So is that loop logically possible? And if so, like, why am I so uncomfortable thinking about it beyond the fact that it's his mother? Um, I mean, it, it both is his mother and it isn't, right? It is his mother, but at the same time, when he meets her, he has, I, I, don't, know how to, I don't know how to formulate it. Yes, sure, sure. So I think this sort of loop, um, I think it contrasts very nicely with the sort of loop that we get in the case of the grandfather paradox. Um, because in the case of the grandfather paradox, it seems to be some sort of causal loop that's going on, but a causal loop um, that kind of has a link that then, um, you, you know, it's a kind of inconsistent causal loop. Uh, where we have a prior link being required for a subsequent link, but that prior link then also uh, does away with the subsequent link in some way. So in the case of the grandfather paradox, it seems like we have a some sort of inconsistent causal loop, uh, which we do genuinely think is a problem. Um, whereas in the cases that you're describing, where you know you go back and you and you, you meet your, your lovely young mother. Um, it seems, well, again, we certainly have a causal loop, right? Um, but it seems, it, it doesn't seem inconsistent in the way the grandfather paradox loop does, right? So we at least have a consistent causal loop in the sense that uh, each uh, cause is giving rise to some effect um, and not sort of eliminating the, the subsequent effect. Um, but I think what you're asking about is well, whether such a causal loop, sh should we think that such a causal loop is problematic, right? Um, and I suppose, I mean, we can ask this in various ways, right? So of course we can ask whether it's, uh, do we think that it's kind of logically problematic, um, logically impossible or possible, uh, maybe metaphysically possible or impossible. We can also ask whether we think that it's physically possible or impossible. Um, on the kind of question of logical possibility and impossibility, I think it's only if you take on sort of fairly strong assumptions about, uh, say, things having a sufficient reason, if, if you have some fairly strong assumptions then potentially you're going to arrive at some sort of logical contradiction, right? So if we're looking at, um, you know, views of cause and effect that were held, say, you know, in early modern times, 18th century, 19th century, um, where the idea was that everything that happened had to have a sufficient reason. And then it seems that this causal loop even though it's consistent, it itself doesn't have a sufficient reason, 
right? Because every link in the causal loop just is the reason for every prior link. Um, and so potentially if you've got kind of strong commitments like this, then this might seem problematic. Um, but I'm, yes, I, I don't think too many, not too many people, philosophers, non-philosophers, scientists, non-scientists, at the moment, I think, have such strong commitments as those. Um, and, well, then, I mean, I suppose on the, on the physical possibility, impossibility uh, question, there is, within the theory of general relativity, um, I'm certainly no physicist, so this is sort of, uh, you know, very, very simplified, watered down, uh, hearsay sort of version. Um, but the claim is that there is a kind of consistent notion of a, essentially a, cl a causally closed loop. Um, and these are termed CTC, so closed timeline curves. And the idea is that a, a material particle uh, could have what sort of translates as its uh, path in time within general relativity, it could have a path that was closed, essentially. So it seems like, um, yeah, at least within certain uh, physical theories that, that, we haven't, uh, that we haven't yet surpassed, um, it's, it's kind of consistent or some version of a closed uh, causal series is is consistent. So kids, you heard it here first. Moral of the story is, uh, you can <laughs> fuck your mother, but you can't kill your grandfather. Yes. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so what's yeah, interesting is, I've, I've been, the reason why Jason can't remember the name of, uh, of this thing is because it sounds like the kind of X-rated version of Back to the Future where Marty McFly actually winds up having sex with his mother as a, you know, <laughs> instead of trying desperately to get his parents to be together. Um, and I suppose what's interesting if you think about Back to the Future as being one of those paradigm time travel movies, there's something odd going on there, right? So Marty McFly and, and Doc go back in time, they're in 1955, and um, Marty happens to bump into his mother who thinks that his name is Calvin Klein because that's what's stitched into his underwear, and she becomes besotted with him. And uh, he sort of at some point realizes that this is his mother, and that if he doesn't ensure that she meets his father at um, this big dance, he will cease to exist. And there's moments in the movie when he, that starts to happen. So he becomes transparent. You know, there's the sense that like, you know, if he doesn't act quickly, he will cease to exist and fade away. And you sort of see these moments from fading away. Um, and he is ultimately successful. He's able to sort of, you know, uh, get his parents to meet each other. They fall in love. And beyond that, he does a few other things. So the sort of bully in the movie um, who starts off, um, the movie is set in like 1985, um, is this sort of like wealthy guy, but he's, he's like a real prick. Um, his name's Biff. And, uh, you know, Marty's able to kind of do a couple of things. So Biff winds up like, you know, washing his dad's car instead of the other way around. And, you know, his dad becomes more successful. So there's this sort of time tinkering that goes on, but there's also some sort of updating of the possibility of time. So is this account of time travel uh, consistent with the sort of philosophical models uh, or is it just pure fiction? Mm, sure. So, I mean, I think, or at least part of what you've described in terms of uh, the, the back to the future case, I mean, if, if all that was going on in that case was that Marty was going back and in some way setting it up such that his parents should meet, um, this doesn't seem, so we, we do have the kind of concern of closed causal loops that Jason raised. So potentially there's a concern there. But if we're thinking only about this change the past, influence the past business, uh, that doesn't strike me as a problematic case. It strikes me as a similar sort of case to, um, say, the Harry Potter case and, you know, the, the prisoner of Azkaban and they're hiding out by Hagrid's hut and, uh, you know, there's, there's a point at which I think Hermione throws a stone at Harry who's inside the hut. That's sort of earlier Harry. Um, and he feels it, you know. And this is, this scene when it happens earlier and they're inside the hut, 
that happens at the time. So it's not that, you know, as, as you're going through the, the series of events from, from uh, past to future, and you have Harry inside the hut the first time round, at least on Harry's account, he, he doesn't get hit, but then he gets hit the second time around. It's that, you, you know, Harry and Hermione have always had an effect on something that happened to their future selves. And so, yes, I mean, by, by the kind of accept, currently accepted models, um, th those sorts of cases are, are really fine. Um, because this just counts as a case of, of having a causal effect on the past, but not making the claim, you know, that the past is some way, and then it's actually never true that it was that way. You know, that it's, it's, it's false that the, that the past was this way. So I think, yeah, these, these sorts of cases, uh, the, you know, Marty getting his, his parents to meet up, uh, at least in that respect, I think they, they, they don't fare too badly um, in philosophical terms, yeah. So the implication is that that's how it must always have been, that there was a Calvin Klein, you know, uh, who got, his, got the parents to meet, and it just happened to be that it was their son. I, I was sort of thinking about this notion of space-time. If you think about a novel that proceeds in a chronological uh, process, right? Um, but it exists in one physical form in one time. But when we're reading it, we have this illusion of time changing. And it might be that what we do is we, there's a certain kind of series of events that occur as the novel goes on. And maybe we get to page 1000 and we find out that there's a character um, who is a time traveler, who is the reason why, you know, we got to the set of events, but it was always fixed in time. Um, so that the levels of causation might not be in the direction we expect, um, but they are fixed in that the novel is the way it is written and there is no other way that it could be. It just happens that the cause happened in the future as opposed to in the past. Mm. Yeah, I think, I mean, this raises two kind of important points. So one is, and this is again a point that, that Harich brings out, uh, in, this, in this case of influencing the past, simply because the past is... Uh, always like that. And I think this is exactly the right description that you've given, you know, that um, in the case of the novel, we have uh, this, it always being the case that the character did this, you know, we can't go back and write the pages of the novel. Um, and so the, the, the claim is just because uh, the past always was this way, uh, under this account, you know, the, the, or, or in the cases in which somebody has, has gone back and influenced, causally affected the past in some way. Uh, it doesn't entail that uh, they weren't able to do otherwise, right? So I think that's one point. And then another point is the kind of uh, the block universe account, which we can get to because, um, yeah, there are other problems posed for... Uh, for, for the possibility of time travel, depending on what view we have of time itself. Um, but just to get back to this, this kind of first question of it not entailing, so just because we suppose that if you've gone back to the past and, you know, Mark has left a, a shoe print in the, in the concrete, Marty McFly has made it the case that his parents have, have met, um, and the, the, the philosophical account supposes uh, or claims that we need to think of that as, as having always been the case. So history was always like that. Um, but the claim is that this doesn't entail that it couldn't have been otherwise. So it doesn't wreak problems for, say, views of freedom or something like this, if we, you know, depending on what free, views of freedom we hold. Um, and the way to see this, I think, is to think of uh, cases of the future, right? So say, you know, tomorrow we all wake up and we, we think, okay, well, you know, what am I going to do today? Mark has already uh, done mal in, so he's got to think of something new to do. And, um, you know, suppose you, you, uh, you and Jason chat and you think about your next guest or something. Um, and you decide that person X is going to be your next guest, um, and you ask this person to join you, and they say yes. So it, it will be the case that it's true that, say, for example, you 
have this person on your show, okay? Um, given that, that that is true in the future, it's not possible for you to make that false. Nonetheless, that doesn't entail that um, you didn't freely choose or you couldn't have done otherwise when you did decide, right? Um, it's just that once you had decided, the future then contained, uh, you know, this person uh, being your next guest. So the case is the same in the past, right? When you are uh, traveling back to, you know, 1935 to Hellesburg, and you're kind of trying to decide, thinking, well, should I take the day off and should I go to the library and see this event? Or should I just get on with it? Should I do some more training to make sure that, you know, things go well? The claim is that you do have a genuine choice there. Um, it's just the one, so, so you can do otherwise. Um, and certain things, you know, could go wrong or couldn't go wrong. Um, but you, once you decide, then history is fixed like that. Or at least once you carry out the action, then history is fixed. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I suppose it's important to point out that there is distinction between um, this idea of history being fixed once it is fixed and history sort of being fixed in advance, which is a kind of fatalist view, which is regardless of what you, um, what you want or what you decide, things will always turn out a certain way. Okay, okay, but now, but now I'm confused. Okay, I, what you're saying makes sense, but, but, there's, a, but there's, a type of, uh, there's a type of fatalism that seems to be creeping in here only in one particular case, but not in others. So it's creeping in when you go back in time. So it's not creeping in normally, but just when you go back in time. So, so please excuse me if, if this makes no sense, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to formulate this in my head. Okay, so, so, so let's say um, the year that Mark goes back to is 1935, right? Um, and he walks past the library and they're busy setting the concrete on the sidewalk, on the pavement. Um, and he steps into the concrete and his footprint appears. Okay. Now, just before Mark traveled, traveled back to 1935, he was in 2020. Okay. And there just happens to be this footprint in the sidewalk, right? And it's been there ever since Mark can remember. Okay. It's bit, there's been a footprint that just so happens to match his, his shoes as he has them in 2020 in, in, that pay, in that sidewalk all this time, okay? Now, Mark then goes back in time to 2035. There's no footprint yet, okay? Surely it is now determined that Mark must then step in that co setting concrete. Otherwise, it would contradict the experiences that he then has later in his life that there is a footprint. If he doesn't step in it, then there will not be a footprint for him to remember seeing in that concrete before. So while you could say, okay, he could have done otherwise his whole life, but as soon as he travels back in time, any influence that he has on the past, like stepping into the concrete, he has to have done. Otherwise he can't have consistently those memories in the future of the past, right? So, so, that's where I get tripped up. I get tripped up because it seems like he couldn't have done otherwise once he goes back in time. Yes, sure. Um, I mean, these sorts of cases have been raised. So it has been raised that potentially there is uh, a similar sort of concern here, you know. Um, and I think, you, you, or at least there's a kind of, there's a, a, a tradition of um, literature, a number of, of uh, or a kind of line of literature that's meaning to distinguish the two cases, right? Um, and I think the idea is something like the following. So I think it really turns on um, what that footprint is dependent on, right? Um, and so we want to say, well, yes, you, you know, in the, in the future, he's seen this footprint, um, and so now he knows that um, 
or at least he's seen this footprint, he's got the memory of the footprint, he goes back in time. And so now it, it sort of, it seems to him that he, that he can't do otherwise, and that it must be determined. Um, but I think the claim is something like it's still consistent. We still get a kind of consistent picture if we suppose that um, Mark there where he is in 1935, it's because of his decision then at that point that there is the footprint in the concrete. And it's then because of the footprint in the concrete that he then goes on to see it and has this memory. But that's so weird, think, Helen. That's totally weird, <laughs> right? right. So, okay, so 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 um, so this is where um, I start to get tripped up in terms of what is freedom. Okay, so uh, we, Mark, we're going to have to do a new episode on freedom. We might have to bring Helen back for this. But but um, basically, there's two different accounts of freedom. The one is compatibilism, and the other one's incompatibilism. Right. So the compatibilist view is that it is possible for you to be free and for all of your decisions in the world to be determined. What does determined mean? Well, it means that given certain, given certain uh, conditions at a certain time, it is only po- the world would have to be a certain way at a later time. So, you know, given that you make this decision, something is going to happen in the future. And given what happened in the past, you are going to make this decision. But incompatibilists say, well, that's not freedom. You can't be free under those conditions. Um, what freedom requires is indeterminism, that given um, conditions at a previous time, you could make different choices at this time. So is there freedom just in the, in the compatibilist sense? Um, you know, have you, in other words, assumed determinism? Is there determinism when you go back in the past? Mm, I mean, my suspicion is that this account, well, I, th- I think it will sit quite happily with a compatibilist account. Um, certainly, even if we take this to be a kind of probabilistic account, um, I'm not entirely sure whether it's going to sit completely happily with um, a kind of incompatibilist account, like a, a strong free will uh, version. Um, so, yes, I mean, if we think of the of the compatibilist account, right? And we want to say, well, the person is free if they have the sort of right uh, psychological setup and they're not, you know, either being uh, unduly influenced by external circumstances or they aren't under sort of some sort of uh, strange or unfortunate internal influences. Then we're going to say, okay, well, good. They've got, they've got free will. And this, this, um, this, this decision or this action counted as uh, a free action. So in this sort of case, we can imagine that, you know, Mark has gone back to uh, 1935, aside from his sort of murderous intent, sort of assuming that we can have free will, even if we have murderous intent, um, we, can, we can think that, you know, Mark has freely chosen to, to make that footprint there. You know, perhaps he... Um, Perhaps he has decided to walk this way around the building rather than that way. We, and he just happens to step in the concrete at that point. Um, we would still think that that counts as a kind of uh, a free action. Um, and so, yes, I would say it, it definitely sits fine with uh, compatibilist views. Um, and I suppose in that example, I was sort of, I was setting aside this question of, because we, we did sort of smuggle in uh, questions about kind of causal loops, right? Because part of the, uh, the, the sort of newer version of the example was, well, Mark has seen his, his own footprint there. He knows that his shoe fits that. And this was maybe entering into his reasons for doing it. Um, and this is then sort of a, a different sort of case, right? Because then maybe we have a causal loop there. Um, but setting those aside, it seems to sit okay with uh, compatibilist views. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, in the case of incompatibilism, maybe it's no worse than uh, this kind of strong version of free will towards the future. Um, I mean, maybe the strong version of free will wreaks as much havoc with 
kind of, you know, views of cause and effect and, and what's going on in the physical world anyway. Um, it's, so it's not, yeah, it's, it's not clear to me um, that it's, it's not obvious to me that it's going to turn out badly. Um, but yeah, I think, I think maybe a bit more work needs to be done. So let me give it a bit of thought this way. So let's say a week ago, I made a choice to order in some Chinese food. Okay. And at the time, let's assume that I was free to do so. Okay. I, I did all the weighing up, I, you know, thought about my options and I made a free choice to order Chinese food. And today I asked myself, um, is it possible for Mark of a week ago to not order Chinese food? It's impossible. The thing has occurred, you know, um, so I, I cannot alter that fact. But there was a time when I was free. And so I suppose here what's tricky is to try and work out when was that time that you were free. So um, because, let's say, I intentionally put my foot in, uh, you know, in the cement, so I want to leave a mark. But the reason that I'm doing it is because I have seen that mark, you know, um, 70 years later. Um, there's some kind of funny compelling force that's playing a role in my choice. Um, and I, you know, I might, you know, be free at the time. Um, but there's also some sense in which I could not, but do otherwise. Um, y yes, I think this is, I mean, I think this is the concern, uh, that, that, that's kind of getting Jason as well, right. Which is, uh, distinguishing, uh, well, I'd wanted to distinguish fatalism, uh, so, so views on which uh, it's it's genuinely not the case that you have any other options available to you, or at least um, regardless of what you what you do, uh, things are going to turn out a certain way. Um, I'd wanted to distinguish this sort of view from uh, what was going on in these time travel cases, and I'd, I'd wanted to say, well, not all cases of time travel. Um, must in, in, involve fatalism. Um, and this at least was put in the form of the claim, well, it is possible for you to do otherwise at the time. So even though you, even though this, the, the series of events, even though history plays itself out in some way, um, nonetheless, other possibilities will open to you uh, at the time of your action. Um, and I think Jason still thinks that there's a, there's a difference between, a kind of worrying difference between um, claiming this with regard to the future. So we might think, okay, well, in the case of the future, um, you know, I genuinely have a range of possibilities open to me. Uh, once, I've, once I've undertaken some action, uh, then history is is that way and that can't be changed but this is not incompatible with the claim that i do have some options or at least that i there are you know a, a various range of actions that i could take that i have other possibilities open um whereas in the in the traveling back to the past case i think jason's concern is that it, it doesn't quite seem to be the case that there are possibilities open to you so i suppose I mean, maybe one way to try and persuade you that there are, so we can think of these cases in which, um, like the stories that, that Jason has mentioned, those short stories, or say that we take uh, your case of the footprint in the concrete um, to be the case in which you have seen this many years later, and you have in your mind that there is this footprint, you've tested it with your shoe, and this somehow compels you to stand in the concrete. Um, there might be cases in which what has happened in the future in some way does determine um, what the time traveler chooses in the past. But I suppose all that we need are some cases in which it doesn't clearly determine this. And then maybe we've got some cases in which we've kind of avoided the fatalism, right? So, I mean, say we just think of you, you know, walking around 1935 Johannesburg and, you know, you can 
preserve. I mean, there aren't too many roads that you can go down, but you could go down this road or you can go down that road, right? Um, assuming that you have no prior memories um, of, or, or, or nothing prior to your coming back to that point in the past is influencing your decision. It's, it's not clear why that would count as um, a case in which you don't genuinely have uh, a range of possibilities open to you. Um, so the, you know, you could choose to walk down this street, you could choose to walk down that street. And so if that's the case, then we have at least found some cases in which um, it seems like the fatalist worry doesn't arise. Um, I don't know, have I persuaded you or Jason? <laughs> well, it seems like what you've done is set up a parallel. So if we think about our original case of the grandfather parallax, there's a logical impossibility in that you cannot kill your own grandfather. And there might also be a logical requirement that you have to put you know, your boot in the cement. But in between, there's a whole bunch of freedom, and that's going to be your case. So that the, the time traveler is constrained by the laws of logic, um, but has some freedom. So I want to think about a, a very recent case. So we've been talking about some classic sci-fi and some great time travel movies. So I'm now going to rewind back to um, a mere couple of days to the latest episode of Rick and Morty, which has a fantastic episode title. It's called um, the, Vat of, uh, the Vat of Acid episode. Um, Jason and I made a special call to Dan Harmon. We said, look, we've got the show, Brain in the Vat. You do us a favor. You know, we, we'd uh, really like, like it if you could... Um, name that episode about our show and he was like cool deal so here's the here's the nature of the episode right um morty says to rick he's like look there's something i really want you to invent which is a game save button so if you're playing an old nintendo game you know you can like save your game state carry on and if you die it's okay you just revert back to the save game state he's like wouldn't it be amazing if we could do that in real life and so you know, Rick is very resistant to this idea, but eventually says, fine, Morty, and he gives him the device. And so the first thing that Morty does is he asks out the best girl in school, and it goes terribly. So he says, okay, I'll revert back to the game set. And he tries a different way of asking her. In this case, he's a bit more nonchalant, and she becomes sort of obsessed with him. And so he keeps keeps at it. And so we see all these sort of trial and error things. Um, he, you know, tries to jump over a manhole. He falls in. He hits the, re you know, the revert button. Uh, he, he meets someone, they fall in love, they, they go on a trip together. He leads this whole other life, you know, um, and then eventually sort of hits the, you know, the, the revert states um, after having a, a plane crash and things like this. And Rick is quite insistent to him that this is not time travel. That this is something else. Um, now, how do we distinguish these things? Because it seems like, you know, what we have is, at least on its surface, Morty going back in time to some prior state where he hit the save button. Um, why is it not time travel? Mm, sure, yes. This, I mean, this is a great case. And yes, I mean, by the end, I think the, uh, yeah, in the insistence that it isn't time travel, they kind of they figure it out in another way, right? They say that all of these things have happened in different possible worlds, something like this. Um, and I mean, I suppose on the on the kind of philosophical account, um, or at least may, under some of the standard views, I think what the main concern would be there, and I think it would be one that we've sort of already looked at, which is um, perhaps it uh, it would be time travel in some sense but it's it's not a possible version of time travel and i think this is for the reason that it's at least it seemed to me the way that i understood it it was a kind of it was essentially a changing of the past right um so it was essentially well look we've got this uh this series of events history contains these events at a certain point in history you can kind of mark that point as the point to which you are going to um, kind of unwind history to. Uh, and so you can carry on merrily beyond that point for a bit. Uh, and then you can, you can unwind, rewind back to, the, back to that point. Um, it really seems to me that the, the concern there simply is 
that you are assuming or kind of positing that history as we understand it is carrying its is is sort of playing out so events are taking place um or you know time is passing in the ways that we normally think of it uh, and then you are kind of denying that so you are in some way claiming that they haven't taken place um, and that they can be done again and i think i mean the philosopher's concern is just going to be well look this is just contradictory um but yes i mean potentially there are more interesting ways of of kind of responding to this philosophically but i think my suspicion is that this is then going to involve something like just a very different metaphysics um to w the metaphysics that we think we have you know um and so it's going to involve a very different notion of what maybe of what time consists in um of what change consists in uh yeah and so it's, it's really not clear to me that we are then any longer talking about time travel where we are talking about anything like travel within the time that we operate you know so so basically the problem that philosophers have is we don't like contradictions right we're saying that contradictions are impossible and given <laughs> that traveling back in time would allow you to generate a contradiction by killing your grandfather for example traveling back in time is impossible or that's version one version two is traveling back in time is possible so long as it is determined that you would not generate a contradiction when you travel back in time and will only influence the past in ways that will not generate a paradox so it, is that the view is the view that time travel into the past is impossible genuine time travel into the past not into a parallel timeline but genuine time travel to the past is impossible or it is possible but only for travelers who it just so happens would not generate a contradiction sure yes so i mean i think well i mean the jury's out <laughs> the jury's <laughs> out but but many philosophers do hold the latter view so i think many philosophers hold the view that um I suppose the view would be that we can formulate a version of time travel along with the kind of needed accounts like say of what's going on in the grandfather paradox um, that we can kind of give you know a relatively substantive consistent account of what time travel would look like um, and then that view really is well time travel is possible um, at least insofar as it's not logically contradictory and it won't involve any of these things that generate paradoxes um the kind of difficult thing to do is to then give an account of why these paradoxes are not going to be generated um and so lewis's view i mean he's he's got a he's got a kind of great line which is um you know why aren't you able to why is mark not able to kill Mel in, in 1935 well for some commonplace reason. So Mark slips on a banana peel while he's trying to kill Mark. Um, you know, or, or some other thing happens while he's trying to kill Mark. So that's so Ted Young's solution, right? That's that's the exhalation. That's his solution, is that something will get in the way, right? Yes, yes. Um, but this seems problematic, right? So it seems fine in a given case. We might say, okay, well, in the case of Mark, aiming for mel you know maybe a bird comes along and lands nearby and uh, and as as mark is taking the shot and then it just uh, he, he just misses by inches it seems fine in any single case but when we try and generalize this as an explanation it turns out in every single case of certain actions um we're never able to take those actions even though it seems like all of the physical conditions are right and so we start to get a, a, a pretty weird general account um of of what's going on 
So from what I gather, you have a, a series of unfortunate events, which in and of themselves are perfectly um, ordinary. But the fact that all of them stack together to conspire against me killing Permel, well, that seems incredibly unlikely. Yes, precisely. Yeah, this is this is the concern. Um, yes, and so one of the one of the concerns is that you you know you're going to have correlations between um, what what are sort of termed foiling circumstances. So circumstances that foil your killing of your grandfather. So you can have a weird correlation between certain sorts of events. Um, and then on the other hand, you're going to have, yes, a kind of lack of explanation of why um, it's, it's not possible. Um, a lack of a kind of general explanation as to why it's not possible for you to, to, to kill your grandfather. So we've really been talking about time travel into the past, uh, but none of these contradictions, am I right in saying, none of these contradictions pop up if you travel into the future. Yeah, I mean, there are, there are definitely far fewer contradictions um, that, that tend to come up or, or paradoxes that are kind of posed uh, about future time travel. Um, and I suppose this is certainly due to, um, well, what is commonly termed the, the kind of arrow of time or the asymmetry of time. Um, and so if we're thinking of say the, the kind of properties or characteristics that time has, say in contrast to space, um, there are many ways in which time is, is asymmetric where space isn't asymmetric. Um, so generally we can carry out actions in the future direction, not in the past direction. Whereas in the case of space, we can carry out actions, you know, in, in this direction or in that direction. Um, similarly, we, we only have knowledge about the past. We don't have the same sort of knowledge about the future, whereas it, it doesn't seem to be the same sort of asymmetry in the case of space. Um, and so many of these, uh, well, the fact that a lot of the paradoxes arise in cases of time travel to the past, I think has got to do with uh, a lot of these asymmetries. And there's been sort of a lot of philosophical work done on um, this, you know, this idea that the time moves from the past to the future and that there are all these asymmetries associated with um, temporal locations and not with spatial locations. Well, Helen, we've had an absolutely wonderful time with you um, and we're going to have to do this again uh, sometime in the future trying to put in as many time jokes as possible. They're like terrible dad jokes. Uh, but, uh, no, really, it has been uh, absolutely wonderful. It's been mind-bending, Helen. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's fascinating. And it, it, it leads into so many other topics like freedom and free will and determinism and causality and metaphysics. And so, yeah, we have to have you back, please. Sure, that sounds great. Yes, there's lots to chew on. I'm happy. Thanks for having me.